My name is Anna Steinberger, and it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce my good friend, Mr. William Bill Orlin. I met Bill and his lovely wife, Edith, some years ago at the Holocaust Museum in Houston, where we spend a lot of time volunteering. Bill usually greets the museum visitors, giving them a brief overview of what they can see in their limited time, and he's also in charge of Survivor Speakers Bureau, trying to meet school requests for a speaker who happens to be also a Holocaust survivor. Bill himself is a Holocaust survivor, and uh, I will just give you a few comments about it because he'll tell you more about his own experiences during the Holocaust. He was only seven years old when German troops invaded Poland and occupied his hometown of Brook, near Warsaw. Bill, his younger brother, his mom, six months pregnant, and grandparents were forced to walk 50 miles and had witnessed all kinds of atrocities. What ultimately saved them was the Russian occupation of Eastern Poland. They lived for a while in Belarus, where his second brother was born, until Germany invaded the Soviet Union in uh, 1941, and they had to flee again further east, ending up in Uzbekistan until the end of Second World War. His third brother was born there in 1944. Life was very difficult, particularly due to chronic hunger and other shortages. After the war, the family lived in a DP camp in Germany until immigrating first to Canada and then uh, moved to, uh, to Houston. Bill was drafted into the USA Army during the Korean War and served in Germany, where in 1954 he became a naturalized USA citizen. After being honorably discharged as corporal, he got married, started a family, and a successful business of beauty supplies. After retiring from his business, Bill has been very busy volunteering at the Holocaust Museum and many other places. He's been contributing to the well-being of our community in so many different ways. So please welcome a Holocaust survivor, an active volunteer, and a wonderful human being, Bill Orlin. After an introduction like this, I'm going to really have to be good. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank all. I usually like to move around, so I'm, I'm doing. If you give me a mic, that would be much better. <laughs> I move around. First of all, I want to thank all the organizers of organizing this wonderful, memorable event. I really want to thank you. Second, I want to tell you how honored I am, truly honored to be here to speak to you today. I speak to a lot of schools and synagogues and churches, but this is a special event because it's Yom HaShoah. And so, Anna covered a lot of territory for me, and I only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to make it quick. So I am from Poland. I was born in 1932 in a little village of Brook. The Jewish people, for the most part, lived in small villages. The Jewish people have been in Poland since about 1100. The population of the Jewish population of Poland was three and a half million before 1939. Ninety percent, ninety percent perished. The little village I'm from consists of only 2,000 people. 834 people were Jewish people. And once the war was over, only 35 survived. 35 people from our little village of Brook survived. Now, we were sheltered for one night in the Catholic church yard, which happened to be right across the street from where I lived. 
The German authorities accused the Jewish people of killing one of the soldiers, and they said unless somebody showed up to admit the guilt of killing a soldier, the Jewish part of town would be burned down. The Jewish part of town was burned down. I sit watching my house burning right across the street. And uh, of all the people that were in, in my little village, uh, many of them were picked up as soon as the German forces arrived, taken out to the forest and shot, mostly men and boys 15 years of age and up. My father was one of the few people who escaped before the advancing Germans. And so the group that was remained in the Catholic churchyard was only about 50 people, mostly women and children and old people. Next day, we got out to check what's left of the house. Naturally, the only thing left was a chimney. We also went to check on the synagogue. The synagogue was the focal point of the, of the Jewish people in every town, as it is for other people as well. We checked on the synagogue. It was burned to the ground. It was an old wooden structure of the type that was built in Eastern Europe in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, so we spent the night... That night in a house, not knowing what to do, we, the next few days my mother suggested we spend some time with some of the non-Jewish French, which we did. The German authorities called on the remaining Jews to show up in front of the church. At that point, only maybe about a dozen showed up. I have no idea what happened to the rest of them. They lined us up and told us to march. Now, we had no idea where we were going. We ended up on the highway going this way. About 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the German soldier told us, turn around, and we faced this way. There was a clearing in the forest. There was a machine gun facing us. Uh, there was uh, actually, I, by that time, I had, I'm the oldest of four boys. I had a brother who was born in 37. He was two. My grandmother and my grandfather were with us, my mother's parents, as well as my mother, as Anne said, and I said, was expecting so we stayed there looking at these uh, soldiers with the machine gun for a while, not knowing what would happen to us, eventually let us go. So we continued going down the road till we arrived at a T in the, in the highway. There was a highway going this way. We were coming this way. There was a large group of German soldiers on the corner. This was modus operandi, what they next did to my grandfather. When they saw my grandfather, had a beard long beard. He was a very religious person. One of the soldiers produced a scissor and cut his beard. Uh, to, a, to a religious person, Jewish person, the beard is part of his life. So he protested to the soldier telling him, how can you do this? This is part of my life. I'm a, a man of God. So he got slapped for that and the soldier told him in German, Gott ist mit uns. God is with us. Anyway, continued protesting, but they let us go. So we ended up in a, a rural, in a, rather a um, county seat area called Ostrov Mazowiecki. Ostrov Mazowiecki is about 50 kilometers from Warsaw. We stayed there for a number of weeks until on October 31, 1939, we were expelled by some agreement with the Russian authorities and the German authorities. We were expelled from Poland. Uh, a large group of us, maybe about uh, three, four hundred people, that one day, October 31, 39, the people who remained in Ostromazowiecki, the Jewish people, they were taken out November 11, 1939, to the forest and shot. So Ostromazowiecki became Judenrein, that means free of Jews. So we ended up in Belarusia. First we went to the capital of Minsk, spent a few days, then we ended up in a place called Bobrusk, where I started school for the very first time in my life. I was eight years old. I spoke no Russian. I only spoke Yiddish. I didn't even speak Polish well because I'd never been to Polish school. So we spoke Yiddish at home. That's what we call Mama Lushin, which means mother tongue. So I started school in Russia, learned to speak English. On June 22, 41, the Germans invaded Russia. So my mother, my grandmother, my, my grandfather, I mean, froze in the town in, in Belarusia. When you have to speak 10 minutes, you got to hurry. And so um, eventually, after working a day and night and another day, we ended up in Railroad Junction. We um, got separated from my brother and my grandmother because there was a lot of commotion. German Air Force planes came over and strafed the area. We survived. So eventually, we ended up in Russia. 
in a place called Voronezh, Voronezh area. Okay, thank you. I'm being signaled five minutes. Okay, so after the Germans were advancing to the Voronezh area, we ended up on a railroad uh, in a cattle car going all the way. No, we had no idea where we're going. We were dumped in some sand dunes, and it happened to be a place called Uzbekistan. That's where I spent the next few years. I learned to speak Uzbek. I already spoke Russian. Eventually, because we're a Polish citizen, the Polish government in exile asked that everybody who wants to return back to Poland should register. So we did. They picked us up in American army trucks. American, now they made a big impression on me because it had the trucks had a big white star on it. I'll never forget that. They dumped us by the river Amudarya, put us on a boat, and took us to Kazakhstan. From Kazakhstan, we continued on, and we ended up in Ukraine. We spent a number of months, maybe 10 months, in Ukraine. I went to school in the Ukraine as well, learned to speak some Ukrainian. Eventually, we went back to Poland, where we arrived probably in the middle of uh, or maybe first part of 1946. There was a lot of anti-Semitism. The situation was not good. My parents enrolled us in a, in a Jewish children's school. My father couldn't find a job. Eventually, the Jewish underground, at that time it was called Haganah, made sure that we as children escaped from Poland via Czechoslovakia. So we ended up in Czechoslovakia. From there, we went on to Austria. From Austria, we ended up in Germany in a place called Rudesheim, where there's an assembly of all children. There was a few hundred of us, maybe a few thousand. Eventually, the parents came and claimed us. We ended up in two DP camps, one in Poking and one in a place called Fritzlar, outside of Kassel. My father had a father in Houston, Texas, who came here, who left Poland in 1913, when my father was three years old. So my father always wanted to see his father. And so eventually we came here by way of Canada, where we spent a few years, three years. I learned to speak French. <laughs> Within 15 months after arriving, I got a beautiful letter from President Eisenhower saying that I, the friends and neighbors wish for me to serve in the armed forces of the United States. <laughs> so I was drafted. I was sent to Fort Ord, California, that's in Monterey, because I, I passed language tests in Fort Sam, San Antonio. My tests were Russian, German, French, so I was declared a linguist. They sent me to the Presidio of Monterey. They wouldn't accept me because I was not a citizen. Nevertheless, they sent me back to Germany as part of occupation forces. So here I was occupied by the Germans in 1939. Now I'm occupying the Germans as part of occupation forces. <laughs> I want you to know that I also went to uh, G2 meetings, which is intelligence in Frankfurt, Germany, to the V-Corps. And when I applied for citizenship, they suspended me because I was not a citizen. They didn't know I was not a citizen at the time. I don't know why. That's why they say there's a right way, the wrong way, and the army way. <laughs> so, once I got my citizenship, they reinstated me. I was a TINE, man, Troop Information Education Officer for my company, which would consist of 360 people. I was in heavy armor. I came out of corporal. And by the way, I told you before, I'm one of four boys. All my brothers, all my brothers served the armed forces of the United States. All of them. As you already know, I served in the Army. I had a brother who served in the Air Force in Japan, part of occupation forces. Then I had another brother, another brother who was in the Army, but he went overseas, overseas from Houston to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. <laughs> and then I had another brother who was a paratrooper in the National Guard. I got discharged in 55. I got married, as Anna already said. I have four kids, seven grandkids, and I have a brand new grand grandbaby. In fact, we're going to see him next week in San Diego. I'm out of breath. I want to thank all of you for being such a great audience, for being so attentive, but I primarily want to tell you how honored I am, how honored I am to be here. Thank you very much.
visit www.marchofremembrancehouston.org, www.marchofremembrance.org for information on an event in your area. Hear Holocaust survivors, World War II veterans, and or their families share their experiences as victims and liberators. Experience heartfelt testimonies, healing, and hope. Rise up and march against today's anti-Semitism. Marchofremembrance.org, marchofremembrancehouston.org.